Welcome, everyone, to our latest NCAA Social Series. This is episode 45. I'm your host, Andy Katz. Pleased to be joined by Jackie McWilliams, the commissioner of the CIAA, and Dr. Dennis Thomas, the commissioner of the MEAC. Uh, a couple of things first uh, that I want to unpack, which is, and we probably shouldn't need to do this, but I do want to do this, which is, uh, I think there's some misperceptions and lack of knowledge of the CIAA and the MEAC and HBCUs. So I want to sort of start with a baseline here to educate because I'm on a little bit of a soapbox here. And I think sometimes we do, don't do enough education in this country, uh, the full education of US history, especially in the educational system. So I will start with you, Jackie, to those that don't know, explain what the CIAA is. Yeah, so CIAA is the first historically black college and university conference. Uh, we were founded in 1912. Uh, founded in Washington, D.C. We celebrated 100 years of um, our conference in 2012, and so now we're on 109 years. Um, we have one of the largest tournament events um, that brings a lot of people based on the community and the atmosphere that it has um, in a community surrounded by basketball, um, which Dr. McClendon, who was just uh, um, celebrated not too long ago, was one of the founders of the basketball tournament that started in 1946. And there's just a lot of history. There's 12 member institutions. At one point we had 16. Um, we start from South Carolina all the way going up to Pennsylvania. Um, and just a, a great value proposition for education. Our schools were founded to give uh, black people an opportunity to get a degree. Um, and then the sports part came apart along allowing our students to be athletes as well, given they didn't have the opportunity to go to other schools to play the games that they love. And so I would always say, you know, CIAA and any of our HBCU colleges are really focused on educating our students way beyond the game, but giving the game as a part of their educational experience. And in terms of division one, two, and three, um, what was the decision or the historical decision into not being a high level uh, athletic conference? Yeah, you know, if you look at our history, you know, we were in Division One, Two, or Three. I mean, I think how we came into just wanting to play. We weren't members of the NCAA, not accepted as a member of an NCAA. Um, there, there, we played schools that would allow us to play the game. I believe as we incorporated into the NCAA and became Division Two, that probably was the best balance for the CIAA at that time. You know, Dr. Thomas will talk about MEAC as they went to Division One, which is our sister school or brother school that had many of our member institutions to give both of our conferences the best world of Division One and Division Two. I think Division Two has been the best balance based on the financial and based on the expectations of being in the NCAA, and it has just worked for our conference. And so there hasn't been a thought process of moving up or moving down, but just staying at this level where we compete or have competed at our best with some of the top athletes in the country that have come from this conference. So Dennis, if someone comes up to you and say, um, you know, I never heard of an HBCU, what is that? What's your answer? I would uh, say, do you have a, a couple of weeks uh, to uh, spend on this? Uh, because it's, uh, it's, it's very arduous uh, to give a soundbite of, of what an HBCU is all about. But given the nature of this uh, 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 broadcast, uh, I'll do my best with it. Uh, <laughs> um, the um, it's, 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 the MEAC is a compilation of of uh, uh, historical black colleges and universities um, that um, our footprint goes from Dover, Delaware, with Delaware State, and currently uh, to uh, Tallahassee, Florida, with Florida and him. Uh, we will have some institution transitioning out uh, effective July 1, 2021. And our footprint will actually be the same footprint that we had during our founding in uh, 1970 uh, from uh, Orangeburg, South Carolina to Dover, Delaware. But uh, HBCUs are are uh, were founded on a mission statement of providing an education for the underrepresented population. And um, most of, uh, if not all, but most of our institutions originated from the uh, CIAA. 
and uh, as Jackie indicated. And so uh, it was decided in, in 1968 when the, um, uh, a group of visionaries got together and indicated that they wanted to compete at the highest level of NCAA. And, um, and we became uh, an operating uh, conference in 1970. Now, um, uh, first and foremost, we are about educating uh, our students, period, and educating our student athletes for the game of life. And the historically black colleges and universities uh, have been about this business for over 150 years. And also, it's just not uh, uh, educating his, uh, African American uh, students. Uh, we've been educating America. And we've never denied anyone an interest uh, into our institutions. So, upon our founding, uh, we were admitting uh, not only uh, African Americans, but Caucasians, uh, Hispanics. Asian, the whole spectrum. And uh, even though they were in a minority, but um, it was, it was uh, no uh, segre segregated uh, admission policies. It was, uh, if you wanted to be educated, we we're here to educate you. And so um, that's what HBCUs have been all about generally and the MEAC specifically. We have, uh, uh, several members of the uh, Pro Football Hall of Fame, uh, all the way from Deacon Jones, Lynn Ford, uh, Roosevelt Brown, Harry Carson, just Donna Shell, and just on and on and on, uh, Evan Bethea. Uh, so uh, you can get to anywhere you want to go from a MEAC institution, whether it be professionally or whether it be uh, Athletically, uh, our, our alumni and the world is littered with uh, MEAC institutions, uh, alumni who are doing incredibly great things uh, for the world and for America specifically. Uh, currently, um, the vice president- I was just about to say that. Of Howard University, is a graduate of Howard, Howard, Howard University. The first, um, the first uh, uh, African American uh, governor, state of Virginia, is a, is a, a graduate of uh, uh, Harvard University on the law school level and Virginia Union on the baccalaureate level, and uh, so so uh, we've served HBCUs have served uh, America and uh, particularly America when America didn't want to serve African Americans. And so um, uh, our legacy uh, in, in far as we are concerned and any objective uh, analysis is cemented as being making America great. Yeah, I was just gonna say that the moral high ground, the HBCUs have it, other institutions that were segregated do not because to your point, Dennis, uh, there's no question that HBCUs have accepted everyone Whereas other institutions, obviously in the prior to the 60s and maybe you know before that, did not, uh, and that I think is a clear distinction. Um, athletically, and I'm glad you brought up the vice president because I was going to bring that up as well. Um, athletically, one quick question uh, back to you, Dennis: um, the MIAC and the SWAC. The question I asked Jackie just a moment ago: uh, Why did the MIAC and the SWAC decide that Division One was the best level? for them? Well, I, I cannot speak for in detail about the SWAC, but I can for uh, the Mideast Athletic Conference, the MEAC. It, it was the fact that uh, we wanted to uh, not only uh, profile our student athletes at the highest level, but we also wanted to uh, profile our institutions at the academic level, that uh, we could compete as research intensive institutions along with other institutions in our region, uh, of our size, of our scope, uh, all over this country. And that has been proven uh, not only by the uh, research 
uh, a designation by the Carnegie Institution, uh, Carnegie Foundation rather, that uh, our institutions are performing uh, significant research on their campuses. So it's a holistic approach to how we do business uh, in the MEAC and how our institutions are excelling uh, in academically, uh, athletically, uh, socially, and within our communities. Uh, and we, have, we have a much uh, 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 sincere uh, commitment and the courage to activate on our commitment uh, within our communities and, and letting uh, our communities know that we care and that uh, we want to stay involved because we are already involved. So one of the gross uh, inequities, of course, uh, are the dollars. Uh, that has not changed. Um, over time, over decades, uh, that there still is an inequality of dollars going to HBCUs. Um, and it's clear in terms of, as it relates to COVID, uh, obviously uh, certain institutions that have big time football, um, you know, have been able to adapt um, uh, with testing, with literally moving their entire weight rooms outside uh, with all the dollars it takes to outfit a university and athletic department you know, to deal with COVID protocols. Um, there have been schools in the MEAC that have chosen not to participate for health and safety reasons. And I'm sure that we could get into just, you know, the cost of all this is it's, it's, it's massive. Uh, so Jackie, I want to start with you in terms of um, how COVID has hit double. And then Dennis, if you can piggyback off this in the MEAC and in trying to navigate this financially at the same time, the health and safety and trying to off, offer a opportunity for these student athletes to still have an experience like so many other other peers during this unprecedented year. Yeah, so Andy, I, you know, the whole the whole COVID thing I think has impacted us as we all have seen in, in athletics across any institution, whether you're HBC or not. I think we're all trying to make the right decisions for the mental and health and safety and the financial, right? Some of it we're making decisions because we know the financial impact of how athletics has on our programs. We know from a conference, the CIAA basketball tournament, there'll be three and a half million dollars loss of revenue for us by not having the tournament, right? So we have prepared ourselves um, as best as we can to manage those expectations. And it is hard, you know, we've had, we've canceled everything except spring and get the economy to still play without having the conference do a schedule because we can't control these cancellations, but still giving them the opportunity to provide a chance for their students who would lose two seasons to still play. You know, I think uh, leaders are having to make, as we are, leaders in our conference trying to make the best decision uh, whether to allow our students to play or not. For us, it didn't come down just to our athletes. It came to our communities. I mean, all of our schools, most of our schools are in, this, in, in Black communities or in urban communities or cities where, where COVID is hitting pretty high. Some of the state legislation and, and mandates are a little bit different in Maryland than it is in North Carolina than it is in Pennsylvania. I think being thoughtful and how do we work together to help one another and manage what budgets look like, but also how do we keep the conference whole? That's been a big piece. We don't have the same revenue distributions as Division I does in Division Two. For us, our revenue is going to find sponsors to partner with us for our conference tournament um, for the CIAA basketball that keeps everybody else. So we've had to be extremely creative to hold on to our partners to still try to provide opportunities to get through this year, but then get ready for the next year. It has been a struggle and not just for student athletes, for coaches and administrators like myself. You, know, you talk about mental health and well-being and trying to manage every day to keep um, our students going, our coaches going, our board going, keeping people informed staying connected with the NCAA. It just seems like it's been more of a job now than it has been outside of COVID. But I think realistically, we're all trying to make the right decisions based on what we believe we are capable of doing. And COVID-19 for us and CIAA and being able to manage the financial expectations is challenging for some of our schools. Now, some have gotten donations and funds and feel like they can do it. And others, it's just too much of a risk given the state mandate. Dennis, if you could dive in there. Yes, um, uh, first and foremost, um, we are uh, the guiding principles for the, for the MEAC 
it's been very simple from the start and well stated from the start. And, and what's most par uh, paramount for our presence and chances was the health and safety uh, of our students and our student athletes. And, and that has not changed. And, and we keep that as the guiding post and all decisions that are made for the COVID-19 uh, virus. Uh, now, um, as you know, uh, most people might not know, but as you all know, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has had uh, deleterious uh, effect upon the health, safety, and well-being upon African Americans and other minority populations, more so than any other uh, population. And so uh, we take that very seriously. Our institution uh, have uh, made the adjustments, whether it be financially, whether it be uh, uh, medically and, and for the health and safety of their institutions. Uh, so I've always, I've always uh, 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 articulated to our member institutions that we can't be like an aircraft carrier. We have to be like a speedboat. And we have to be able to pivot uh, uh, very quickly, uh, given uh, the unpredictability of this COVID-19 uh, uh, virus. And as you know, an aircraft carrier, you just can't change direction instantaneously. And so I'm very proud of the way that we have been a, uh, able to adjust uh, to this. Obviously, um, not only uh, HBCUs, uh, I think our whole industry of intercollegiate uh, athletics and higher education have been financially impacted significantly. Uh, you see all the uh, uh, data on, on, on the red ink that's, that's, um, that's being uh, uh, splashed around uh, because of this uh, uh, virus. Now, uh, uh, other institutions, or well, I said other and some, have uh, uh, bigger uh, uh, resources to draw from to, uh, to do the best that they can to have an athletic uh, season. And some uh, does not. And that had an impact as well on whether or not uh, we are able to uh, play in a manner that would not um, affect the health and safety of our students and student athletes. Whereas uh, if we would have had uh, additional uh, a pitless reservoir of resources, then um, we might have come to a different conclusion in terms of whether or not we can uh, have a fall season. And, um, and you've, you've seen how the fall and the spring has played out as it pertains to uh, intercollegiate athletics, uh, postponements, cancellations, so forth and so on. But um, as a whole, uh, we are doing, uh, we're doing uh, uh, more than uh, adequate in adjusting uh, our campuses and our budget so that we can uh, uh, get through this uh, pandemic. Now, um, what, what's been a very comforting and salient point See, HBCUs uh, have done more with less than more people do with more, okay? O okay? And that's the way we have uh, survived and in most cases thrived uh, during our 150 years of existence. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you've been underfunded, and, and I'm not talking uh, uh, just emotionally here, I'm talking facts-based uh, mm -hmm. conversation here. If you look at the state legislatures uh, down through the years, and this is confirmed that the HBCUs were significantly underfunded uh, and during their whole existence, still underfunded now. So, um, but uh, we have not uh, uh, acquiesced uh, and uh, we still uh, committed uh, to developing uh, people to be better citizens for our society. And one thing, the uh, common denominator, uh, Andy, 
about this whole situation. Um, most things that you need to be successful uh, really doesn't have to have to do with resources. Yeah. It has to do with that intrinsic internal makeup yeah. in terms of your determination, your hard work, your discipline, your motivation. All those things doesn't cost money. Those things resonate from within. Those things are inculcated in you by the people you surround yourself with. And that's that whole community of HBCUs. Yeah, I mean, first of all, uh, the, the schools and the MEAC and the SWAC that go on these barnstorming tours in November and December and don't play a home game for two months, they're not doing it because they want to. Uh, it's, you know, it's a financial decision that they have to. Um, and that's a fact. And a lot of people don't understand, well, why is, you know, Texas Southern playing 11 straight road games? Well, because they can't get anyone to come to Texas Southern. And so they have to obviously take the guarantees. And that's the way it's been in the past. And some people that put their head in the sand and don't realize it. All right, I want to shift to vaccinations. Um, obviously, in the black community, um, there's a history here of mistrust of, of uh, vaccinations historically in this country being taken advantage of, being experimented on. And so there is history there, but it's going to be imperative that the vaccinations, obviously, through every epidemiologist at the highest level, that we need to get the majority of the population, obviously, vaccinated. How do you think that will be handled once it becomes more online, hopefully, in the next few months, for the populations in the CIAA and in the MEAC, that that educational aspect is taken over to where uh, more student athletes, more faculty, more staff, more coaches, more people in your communities get vaccinated. Jackie, if you could go first. Yeah, you know, the, we had a conversation with one of our partners um, back in January as we were giving them updates about their opportunities to work with us, um, even through COVID and preparing for this tournament. So we'll have several sessions to educate the community, our CIAA fans or anybody who wants to be a part of it during our tournament virtual week at the end of the month. Um, and they'll have an opportunity to have uh, professionals, you know, from our community as supporters um, to educate to educate our community. And one of the things that our partners said is that we are a trusted entity. You know, the CIAA, the MEAC, they trust us. They value the work that we do. They value what comes out of our conference. And so when we have Black doctors or professionals that speak to them, and encourage them and give them the information or the misinformation that they don't have, we're hoping that that will encourage them to want to get uh, tested and want to get the vaccine. Um, and even within our own community with our presidents, I know our presidents have talked that we have weekly calls, you know, about their role in getting their vaccines and celebrating. You know, there is a lot of um, information or what, what our people have gone through in the past of getting vaccines and what that meant has meant and how scary that can be if you don't have the right information. So we're hoping that through our conference and what we're able to do, we're able to educate everybody in our membership, educate our fans and let our partners help us do the same so that we can get uh, people encouraged, encourage them to go get the vaccine, including myself. I've had my own hesitancies about it. I'm probably fourth on the list before I can get it. Um, but I do think it's important if we want to get back into some whatever that normalcy is, um, that we have to trust or begin trusting our community leaders and those who are saying that we should get it so that we can get back to some normalcy. So there's some work to do. Totally. There's a trust factor that um, Black people or African Americans, brown and, brown and Black people have to get that trust factor within our communities that what is being told to us and how we take that information will help better our community. Yeah, I, I um, echo what uh, Jack has indicated. Um, but you, you touched on the mistrust, uh, Andy, uh, in terms of this uh, uh, back, you know, vaccination, uh, the Tuskegee experiment, and that still resonates with our community. And, uh, uh, and there are some other instances uh, as well. Uh, but uh, our campuses, the MEAC campuses, are well positioned uh, to assist in, in the promulgation of, uh, of the vaccine and the, and the ability that it is uh, worthy for everyone to be vaccinated. And, and there's a reason why for, for that assessment. 
And, and the reason is, is that uh, in the MEAC, we have uh, uh, pharmacy, schools of pharmacy on our campuses. And uh, at, at, uh, we have medical schools at, uh, at Howard and, and uh, other professional schools. So uh, we, are, we have a better uh, communication path to educate uh, our population that the vaccine is safe. And, and that is based upon the information that we have as professionals, because our institutions have these professional uh, uh, curriculum and they would not uh, disseminate any uh, uh, bogus information uh, to our population. Now, and that's critical. And, and so that's another touch point that will allow our population to feel easy, much easier about getting the, the mm -hmm. vaccine. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, some of our, if not all of our presidents who fit in the categories that are established by the CDC mm -hmm. uh, have publicly uh, taken the vaccine so the public can see that it's okay. If I'm taking it, it's okay. Uh, for you to take it, because uh, uh, from from the uh, CDC and from my uh, reading of the research, um, this has been catastrophic uh, for our country, and it's been more uh, catastrophic in the minority community, as I indicated. Now, uh, the difference is now is the uh, research that has been done clearly indicated that pre-existing conditions, that's, that's, that's more prevalent in an African-American community. And I don't wanna get into the depth of that about healthcare and all the going to the doctor and on, on a consistent basis, but the, the being infected with this pandemic that has a tremendous expect, uh, effect upon pre-existing conditions. Mm -hmm. And so you get a double whammy there. But um, uh, I think that uh, our institutions are doing a, a tremendous job of uh, educating our public about it's safe to, uh, to uh, get the vaccine. Yeah, we could do hours <laughs> on socioeconomic disparities, the food wastelands and urban communities, the lack of access to medical care, pharmacies, uh, the fact that more minority communities live in multi-generational homes, which are a feeder system for this virus. I could go on and on, um, but I don't want to digress down that road. Uh, but those are the facts as well. All right, one last topic I want to dive into, which is to affect change. And we saw this over the summer, um, you know, post George Floyd's murder, the empowerment of student athletes to get out and speak and be embraced really by their athletic departments, their universities. And then the voting rights initiative in the fall that really should not have been partisan, some people made it partisan, but to be engaged at the local level, not just the presidential level, because it matters who the sheriff is, who the judge is, who the attorney general is in your particular community and state. Um, so at the NCAA level, both of you have been active on being on commi committees, on trying to affect change because you can't affect change if you don't have a seat at the table. The lack of diversity in corporate offices, in newsrooms, I could go on and on as well. That's a whole nother show. But both of you, I'll start with you, Jackie, as to why you felt um, at some point, you know what? I need to be a seat at the table or we need to have a seat at the table to help affect change. Um, because I have mentors and colleagues like Dennis Thomas, honestly. I mean, he's the reason why I got into the business or at least got my first job in position um, in college athletics at Virginia Union. Um, he pays attention. You know, I try to pay attention as my leaders have to provide access and opportunity. And if you're not at the table, even if it's just one of us, then how do we create access and opportunities for others? Specifically, if you're the only one and others around the table don't believe in the same access and opportunity that you do. 
I think every day, 365 days a year, working in the CIAA, the NEAC, or any of our HBCUs, this is our life work. It's passion work. It's our job to make sure that these student athletes see themselves beyond the field and they can see that there's career opportunities and they can see the issues in their communities that we need them to help give back. I mean, all the economic disparities and poverty. I mean, we work in college athletics. We just want to run games. But when you work in HBCUs, it's so much more than that. And so in order to get to help support what's so much more than that, you got to be at the table. So Dr. Thomas or Dennis and I are not just in athletic tables, we're outside of other tables in our communities and nationally to make sure that our voices, our stories are told and that administrators and student athletes have the access points that we had or been limited to. And so we're in this, it's passion work. Not everybody in my opinion can work in historically black colleges and universities. You gotta truly understand the foundation and why we exist and the opportunities that we have to change the lives of everybody, right? And Dr. Thomas has been great in helping me sustain in the business and trying to stay focused on things that matter and not worry about what everybody else says or why. I mean, when, when somebody makes a comment to you that you're gonna work for the have, when you, why would you work for the have and not have not, right? Why would I even work for the CIAA when I can stay here and work in that? That's a disheartening conversation for somebody to say that does not even understand the passion and the opportunities that myself or Dr. Thomas who sit in circles can bring to others. And so that's why I think Andy, it's important that we get at the table so we can make sure that others see, other people see the value of what they're missing if they don't let us at the table. Before you comment, Dennis, I'm just curious if you have any, and I wanna put you on the spot, Jackie, but if there's any anecdotal, anecdotal evidence or moment uh, I mean, you don't have to throw anyone under the bus, but just where you being in the room might have opened the eyes to someone else that they may not have thought about a potential inequity had it not been for someone from an HBCU being in that room on a committee. Uh, several. Okay. Times. I mean, several, and it's not to, to shame. I mean, you know, working in Division One men's basketball, I've had some hard conversations just about making sure what the images look like and how they should um, exemplify who we say we are and who's on the court, um, you know, with our partners. I mean, I, I think it's, it's an every day and, you know, selecting interns that come from historically black colleges and university. And when you see our students that are confident, they have been taught to advocate for themselves, to learn their voices, to compete with the best of the best. And that's intimidating to others. You know, you got to be at the table to say, no, 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 no. What you're about to get here is a gym. This person could be the next commissioner. This person could be the next director, opposed to seeing it as they're too aggressive, right? These are conversations that we have with our students that I have with people who don't look like me to make sure that they understand that there is value what we bring to the table. All we want is access, equity, and opportunity, right? And so HBCUs bring that. We bring great value into, in, in communities, economically, jobs. There's so much more that people just don't understand. And like Dr. Thomas says, we're resilient. We work with little and less. So this COVID thing that might be shaking up a lot of people, it's got us a little shook, but not enough that won't help us keep moving on with our passion um, to drive excellence with our students and our coaches and administrators. And most of all, our member institutions that sit in communities where they watch us every single day. So the pressures out of our colleagues have, they're not the same pressures, doc, pressures that Dr. Thomas and I have. We just take them in stride because this is the work that we do every day. Dennis, could you just uh, dovetail off of that about being on committees? Yes, um, uh, I've been, haven't been in the business a long time. Jack is just uh, in, getting into it in the midway. <laughs> And, and I'm at the, at the uh, close to the end. Um, I've been on representative leadership committees uh, for a long, long time. And um, uh, through the NCAA uh, and other national organizations and uh, uh, even uh, inclusive of the National uh, Football Foundation and College Hall of Fame as well. And, and um, uh, I've always been committed uh, to this to this process of diversity and inclusion, and um, 
and uh, there's ways that you can get that done. And some of the times you don't have to stand up on the table uh, to do that. But some, but some circumstances calls for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you have to have this discernment to know when to do either. <laughs> so, um, uh, but. Uh, my approach uh, and all the corporate partners that we have, uh, it's, 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 it's my responsibility uh, to take a deep dive with them in terms of how uh, diversity adds uh, to your bottom line and affects your bottom line in a positive way. And uh, uh, I've been able to do that. We've been able to do that over my career. And I say that because I've seen results. And also I've, I've seen um, corporate uh, America um, wasn't interested in, in our community. And so uh, I have a unique perspective uh, on both sides of the ledger there. And, and Andy, you talked about uh, voting, but uh, I, I want to digress for a moment, if you will, um, you know, about the virtues. You know, uh, uh, you know, the Catholic Church and Christianity, uh, you know, if you had to be bestowed upon the virtues of having uh, prudency, having uh, wisdom, having courage, having mm -hmm. faith, hope, and charity. Um, I, would, I would wish to be bestowed carriage uh, because out of all the virtues, out of all the commitments that you can have, if you don't have the carriage to stand up and, and not tolerate some things, then you're not gonna move that needle for, for justice. Uh, move that needle for opportunity. Uh, and um, uh, because you have a lot of people who are well-intentioned, but they don't have the courage to say, we're going to do this and, and, and give others an opportunity based upon uh, the content of their character, not the color of their skin, and based upon their competence, based upon their proficiency. And so uh, I have a short tolerance span uh, when people are not given an opportunity. Um, but the original question was about voting. Uh, uh, you know, we, we've been at the forefront, the MEAC and our institutions have been at the forefront of getting our community to vote. And that's how you exercise your right. You've had people to die for the right for for our community uh, uh, to vote. And our institution has been at the forefront of that, even in Greensboro, North Carolina, at, at, at the uh, Woolworth uh, uh, students uh, protested there in, at Morgan State in Baltimore and so forth and so on. We had, we had a uh, initiative of us uh, uh, registering all of our student athletes for this past uh, November election and getting other students to have full participation uh, on, on voting. So uh, our institutions uh, have always been active in our communities uh, to get people out to, to, uh, to vote, to exercise their constitutional right. So uh, that being said, I think that the record will show that uh, minorities had a significant impact on who was elected uh, uh, in this country, and you and you and you brought up a very a germane point of who the sheriffs are going to be, who the council members are going to be, who the mayors are going to be, who the judges are going to be. I mean, that's 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 what it, the the works get done. Yeah. And and so I appreciate you for for articulating that. Yeah, I would always, uh, and I love the fact that um, the late great civil rights icon, John Lewis's legacy will be good trouble uh, because I hope people remember that for many years. And, I, and you brought up the, the Woolworth counter. I, I would just say that 
when we get back in a post COVID, if, ever, if anyone's ever at the Civil Rights Museum in Atlanta, that exhibit related to the Woolworth counter, most chilling thing I think I've ever seen in terms of putting on those headphones and feeling your, like literally you are there and they're screaming in your ear and they're pouring a milkshake over your head. Awful, but at the same time, it puts you there and makes you remember. Um, I'm gonna shift up a little segue here, a little positive to end it here, um, which is um, quickly, if you can, uh, Dennis, and then you, Jackie. 50 years of the MEAC, 110 of the CIAA. Uh, what, at this moment in time, for 50 years of the MEAC, do you want people to know about the legacy of this great conference? The, 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 the legacy of this conference is cemented in America and uh, uh, of achievement, of excellence, and a commitment to the betterment of not only our communities, uh, but for America. And we've had our hands in the success of this country and, 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 and with our institutions uh, making a commitment to graduate uh, talented students uh, from our campuses. And, and the MEAC have, have, have continued to lay uh, not only the foundation uh, for success of our students. And that's because we care. Uh, we care uh, 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 about our product that we send out uh, to the world. And yes, we've had tremendous success uh, athletically, but I would submit to you that we have even more greater success uh, academically. And Jackie, 110 years. What should be the legacy so far of the CIAA? Uh, you know, just to piggyback off of Dr. Thomas, I mean, I was a student athlete in this conference. Um, you know, I've been in this conference since I was 18 years old. And the traditions and the legacy of who we are, you know, with our brand um, across the world. You may not know all of our institutions, but you know the brand of the CIAA and what it has done and who's come out of our conference, even our founder, founding members, Hampton, Howard, Lincoln, Shaw, uh, Virginia Union, you know, strong traditional schools, whether they're in our conference or not, they are part of our legacy. I would also say that the leadership in our conference continues to be phenomenal from our board all the way down to our student athletes, to alumni who are doing things across the world who represent, you know, the CIAA and all of our HBCUs and helping telling the stories and the, the, the meaningful ways that we show leadership in the things that we do and the decisions that we make every day is impactful. And then lastly, just our community. Like we love our community. We love the community of HBCUs. When you talk to students about being in the CIAA and what that means to them and their ways of giving back, back to their institutions, volunteering in their community, and making sure that they make a lasting imprint and footprints in the community that are championships in the CIAA with partnerships like with Samaritan's Feet. It is meaningful. And I think between all of our HBCUs, but specifically CIAA, that the legacy will continue and live on with or without me. It has its brand and its name all by itself um, that has the ability to continue to leave larger footprints way after myself. Wow. This has been great. I appreciate both of you. Uh, Jackie McWilliams, the commissioner of the CIAA, and Dr. Dennis Thomas, the commissioner of the MEAC. Uh, wish you nothing but the best. Success. Stay healthy. Hopefully a return to semi-normalcy uh, for the year of 2122. Uh, a reset, hopefully, for all of us uh, when we start back in the fall. Uh, still work to do, obviously, between now and then. Uh, as always, um, you can go and check out ncaa.org slash social series where all, where all our uh, social series are archived. You can check all our episodes. We're approaching actually a year and a couple of weeks since Andy, we started the series. Yeah, you, last word in here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and uh, I just on behalf of Jack and myself, uh, we want to thank you and your, and your team for doing this and yeah. bringing uh, awareness to the, to, to the HBCUs. So uh, you and your team, uh, uh, kudos to you all for allowing us to uh, communicate our thoughts today. Well, thank you. This should not be just a once a year deal. People should recognize this uh, all the time. Uh, so once again, check out our archive, ncaa.org. Stay safe, everyone. We'll talk to you next week.